What's going on, Mark, my reef therapy brother? How you been? Oh, good, man. Long time no speak, I guess. It's been... Yeah, no uh, speak, no see. Yeah. Um, we've kind of failed to uh, pat ourselves on the back for our previous session, which is 50 episodes of reef therapy, and here we are at 51. And, uh, man, we got a lot to talk about since last month. Um, I went to Australia for reef stock, Australia, uh, did some low tide reef walking in Southern Great Barrier Reef, and then went to New Caledonia, did some diving, checked out their public aquarium. Um, but man, I think the overarching thing that I want to get across is the way I set up my tanks without so many bells and whistles and just really reliably really reliable equipment and you know very frequently serviced and cleaned i i had no worries i was not worried about any single thing my only concern was while i was gone it was the heat of the summertime and with all the lights going you know it warms up the inside and so that air conditioner has to run a lot just to keep the temperature down so that was the only thing i was keeping an eye on but otherwise um did the proper preparation before I left as far as cleaning out some detritus and, you know, making sure everything was tip top shape when I came back and, oh man, all the reef tanks look amazing. They look so freaking good. It's, you know, when we do changes to our reef tanks, it, you'll, you'll look at the tank intensively for the next few days, you know, just to see how it, how it turned out. But it's another thing to do that and then leave for over three weeks and come back and be like, oh yeah, that really worked. <laughs> Or didn't, like in my case, where I thought, all right, I'll try this bacterial dosing that everyone seems to talk about. And then I came back and the tank was a mess uh, after a week. So so bring us, bring me and us back to speed on, I guess it was your, your LPS tank downstairs. Um, you were having some challenges with just growths and uh, dinos and maybe a little bit of red slime. Where are you at with that now? Yeah, so I had dinos. I had a little bit of cyano. Well, I had cyano, and then I was always thinking that's a nutrient bottom out, but, you know, people were swearing by bacterial dosing, and I thought, okay, screw it, I'm going out of town for a week, I'll just put uh, some bacteria on a doser, and I did, like, the tiniest amount, like, you know, um, but then I came back, and I think I just made things worse, and I had dinos, um, I tried all the dino tricks right as silicates for um fostering a diatom bloom and you know dose phyto add copepods and and the funny thing is, is that eventually i just got so frustrated sitting around drinking a beer thinking about how my upstairs tank was perfect and my downstairs tank is not so just for giggles i said well why don't i just make my downstairs tank like my upstairs tank so I, uh, I removed the automatic filter roller, which will probably be to your dismay because I know you're a big fan. And I, I was a big fan of it too, but I just said, let's just go apples to apples. And I threw a bunch of Kato in the sump with a light. I, um, <clears throat> what else did I do? Oh, I actually put my old lights back on. Uh, I just went full medieval on the thing, right? And um, can't say why, but all of a sudden, cyano's gone, diatoms are gone. The Goni operas that were kind of pissy at me were coming back. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know? No, I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, in the reef aquarium hobby, we usually advocate to do one thing at a time. But since you already have an example of a working reef tank that works for you and functions the way you want it, um, sometimes you just got to roll back to the basics and the fundamentals. You know, I would say... I would hazard a guess that probably adding the ketomorpha was the, the biggest difference that you did to your tank, at least yeah, as far so. as concentrating the uglies um, where they are. Now, with the filter roll, did you just open the door, open the bypass, or did you no, take it off? No, uh, because I needed room for the Kato, so oh, okay. I pulled it out, and uh, there was a guy online. Ah, shoot, I wish I could remember his name because it's a cool product, but um, it's basically a magnetic held baffle that fits like custom sumps you know you can adjust the width of it so I popped that in so I could keep the Kato from getting chewed up into my skimmer and all that and then I just threw an old Tunzi light on it so I didn't have room to keep the filter roller I would have liked to have done that because because yeah. to your point it would have been interesting now to turn that mechanical filtration back on uh, with the Kato in place um, 
I, you know, maybe removing the filter roller also made things dirtier, right? So uh, less of a nutrient bottom out kind of situation. I yeah, don't but know. then you added the keto, which basically is removing the nutrients and concentrating right. the uglies. I don't know. I, I think it's yeah. nice. Uh, I know it's not your favorite to talk about your on and on and on again off again battles with dinoflagellates but i think it does illustrate to reefers who are struggling with it that um even if certain tricks work on one tank they work won't work on another tank and man that is true of a lot of reef aquarium advice and expertise no that's exactly right like i'm not gonna obviously there are people with cato in their sump that have dinos right um and there's obviously people that have filter rollers and don't have dinos and it's so none of this is related i just wanted to make it apples to apples and then just apply the same regimen and same maintenance on both tanks and just see what over time happens right and it's just interesting to me that everything fell in line like my how long did it take like honestly uh the dinos disappeared in a week and i'd say the cyano after about two weeks and now i have like white crushed coral mixed with sand sand bed everything's pretty it's crazy it's weird i i don't know why i really don't but um i'm doing water changes which is what they tell you not to do with dinos right because again you could bottom out your nutrients but given that i had some pricey uh flower pots right goniopras i i that were closed up i was also again i didn't have time to do one thing at a time right like in another month i'm going out of town for a week so i just said i don't care if i know what the answer is like oh let's just turn one lever at a time and see what happens i ain't got time for that so i just said i'm also going to throw some water changes at it because maybe there's something in the water chemistry that's pissing off these corals um and you know definitely held my breath when i started to do that you know was i going to bring the dinos back but yeah all is well so kind of weird no, kind of that funny also, that also kind of shines a light on you see a lot of reefers with tank fulls of toys and all the bells and whistles and they're trying to make this accessory work and they're trying to make this piece of device equipment work and they're trying to make the equipment work uh, it, like separate to making the reef tank work you know what i mean i think mostly i uh, would usually consider like folks who have uh, algae scrubber or macroalgae reactor who are dosing that and they're trying to grow to macroalgae but their tank is totally fine you know and so the fact that you were able to just say hey i'm going to get rid of this automatic filter roll functionally you don't even really care what the problem is you just kind of know what the solution is or something closer to the bullseye and you went for it and i think that's some really good advice for people to use on their tanks you know if you have a lot of bells and whistles and lots of pieces of equipment um do what's best for the tank right not for the circus of aquarium devices and equipment that you might have running on it yeah and it's i, I don't know you know there are certain things that you should be able to do to a tank and it it um how do i put this i don't know if you find a just kind of a method that works for you that's very simple and just you know like somebody said it best about how what lengths people go to avoid water changes oh yes you know and it's just like <laughs> or just do water changes you know and and um i just thought simplifying and going with something that i know were you know that i've i've always done right you've known me since the dawn of reef keeping our you know not dawn of reef keeping but our dawn of our, reef keeping. <laughs> our era of reef keeping and I've always been a refugium guy. I've always been, you know, I like substrate. So I just said, like, just go with what works for you. And then when things aren't working, at least you can kind of, you're not left wondering, well, is it because I'm trying something new or, you know, so, so it's, it's all good. I'd like to put that filter roller back on because I really liked it. Uh, it, you know, it was, I felt like it was a really good tool for, uh, nutrient export as well as uh, just even water clarity you know well, you, you still have it you know yeah. like right now is the most important thing is making your corals happy right yeah. you don't care about what the skimmer is doing what the automatic filter roll is doing whether your keto grows or not you don't even care if your keto grows right no all you care about is that your dinos are mostly gone and your cyano is mostly gone and whatever you did to the programming your corals look happier that's that's the most important thing yeah Yes, yeah, so that's where that's at. 
what I was able to do um, the weekend before I left for three weeks, it, oh God, it feels like a freaking eternity. Um, I got rid of a lot of corals. Nice. They were, um, I took a bunch of corals into the local fish store, got myself some credit for future corals that I don't need, but probably just for you know fish. I really want to fish out my tanks a, a lot more. Um, and then there was a coral farmer's market, um, I think the Saturday before I left, and there was one really nice endophilia, and I forget the name of the company, but they're in Texas. I'm sorry for forgetting your name, but it has big, beautiful yellow endophilia, like the one you got, but more yellow and about oh, nice. twice the size. And he ended up uh, just giving it to me at the show and came to the studio and I just gave him everything that I had doubles of. I'm talking about, you know, colonies of um, Acroporus. So yeah, he traded in that endophilia for about two boxes of corals and taking that extra weight off of my tanks as far as like mineral demands and uh just space um i was just the corals look so much better um also as far as having like more room for water flow which prevents the tritus build up man i can't tell you how much of a burden it is to have too many corals right <laughs> when you have a, a place of this this scale and magnitude and you don't have like an exit strategy for the extra corals um that's been one of my my biggest challenges but one thing i, I definitely noticed is when i'm here at the studio um, i do a lot of freestyle right freestyle dosing of minerals which is fine uh, you know as long as the values of calcium alkaline and magnesium stay within a certain range no yeah. problem, right? But while I was gone, I instructed Evan specifically on dosing nitrates and phosphates and isolate trace elements. Um, and I don't, I don't do those very regularly. But while I was gone, he did those to you know the prescription to the letter, and I really noticed the difference. I really noticed the difference of just having a little bit more regular nitrate addition and phosphate addition. You know, from week to week, I'm like, oh, I should dose a little bit more this week, or I should dose a little bit less this week, or should I dose more frequently? And just having him do something specifically every week, um, I just see a real big difference in the tank. In nice. the tanks, yeah, yeah, they look really good. And I, I just can't overstate how peaceful I was away from my tanks for three weeks. There's nothing in the back of my head nagging me about what if this fails? What if that fails? There's just this whole place is designed against having these, you know, cascading reactions. <laughs> if one thing breaks, then it causes so many issues. And um, because we service things so frequently and keep really keep an eye on all the different pieces of equipment, um, man, I was just calm as a Hindu cow, just watching the temperature because it, it was early August and, you know, getting really hot. Um, but yeah, it's really nice to come back I could just see everything in really, really good shape. Yeah, I think if my reef tanks could not be left alone for a week here and there, I'd have to quit the hobby just because... <laughs> because then it's not a hobby. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's now you're beholden to this thing and you, you can't enjoy, you know, your adventures, your vacations with your family and all that. So that's... I'm, I'm in your boat. I, I've automated a lot of things mostly because I... One, I like that kind of stuff, but two, I don't have people I can consistently call upon to check on my tanks all the time. I've got one friend who has a reef tank, and he's got a really busy schedule that if there's an emergency, he'll come over, right? Right. <clears throat> but I, he also lives on the other side of town, and like to ask him to come over every other day would just be ridiculous. Um, yeah. No, I had a lot of people asking me before I left, knowing that... At they knew that Evan was, you know, going to be here almost every day. Um, They're like, hey, you know, I know Evan's got it, but if you want me to just check on or, but I had a lot of people on call and thankfully cool. dude, there was not a single freaking roadblock. And that's probably because I spend most of my time when I am here <laughs> being paranoid about what is going to fail or at least not function properly. But, uh, you man, know, to your point about controllers, um, I thought about this because I have a really good local fish store, right? Uh, you know, George. And of course. And if there ever was an issue in my wife's home, I, w I always tell her, well, just call my local fish store, Pure Reef, and I'm sure they'll send somebody over for a small fee to, to help out. But I've done so much random, crazy automation that I imagine that even a super experienced reef keeper dude from that fish store would come in and be like, I don't know what's going on here. And it made me kind of think about is it better just to have a webcam on everything? And if something does go wrong, they can come over and they can swap out a skimmer or a return pump or put a new ATO on it if it's all simple. 
But if you got all that crap programmed with if else statements and, you know, fusion and they're going to be like, whoa, you know, what am I breaking by unplugging this? And I was just thinking about you uh, when I was out of town thinking about that. And I was like, you know, that that's another kind of con is the more complex you make it, you increase your failure points, but you also make supporting it by a third party way more difficult. So anyway. The young uh, Ali of Amazing Aquariums and Reefs with his, you know, three outlet reef tank, yeah. right? Return pump, <laughs> a flow pump, a skimmer, and a light. Anyone could service that. But at the moment you start getting tricky with flow meters and dosers and all kinds of programming that are in a black box that, that they can't access, it just makes it really, really challenging. But like, I've had tricky reef tanks in the past also. And if I don't interact with them on a regular basis when i have to fix something even i'm like oh wait how did i set this up <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't even remember yeah that's true i had an interesting experience i um i'm bad about calibrating my ph pro but i try to do it i don't know once a year <laughs> i probably should do it more often but once i calibrate it i would always have a ph around 8.3 or so you know and i was like oh everything's good you know i don't use a co2 Cal base calcium reactor. I don't. Um, I don't do anything crazy with CO2 scrubbing. But uh, two months ago, I had all the windows in my house replaced. Um, I think it was about 26 windows or something like that. That's a lot of windows, <laughs> dude. And they were all these 1990s double hung wooden windows where you could see a little bit of daylight peeping through here and there, you know. And um, of course, you know when you research what kind of windows to buy one of the factors is air infiltration right and something with a really good rating means it doesn't allow a lot of air in uh that's what you want out of a window um so i i recalibrated my ph probes and all of a sudden it was telling me my ph is now much lower um and on both of my aquariums right so both of my aquariums have lower ph and i was like that's interesting and i at first i thought well could it really be that, you know, I have higher CO2 in the house? I don't know. Um, the problem is I don't have a measurement of what my CO2 levels were before I swapped out the windows uh, that I can recall. So I don't know if it's related, but it's kind of interesting that uh, my pH did go down because I, I was very skeptical about a lot of people going on the pH craze with CO2 scrubbers and all that. I don't intend to do any of that. Because uh, my tanks are fine uh, as they are, but uh, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. It's you know maybe some of my perspective was somewhat skewed with the fact that I probably had a quite leaky house, and now uh, I would say that highlights a very important point that anyone who's chasing pH before you go and put a CO2 scrubber, relay recirculating CO2 scrubber, or uh, you know um, the air exchange systems on your entire house buy a freaking co2 monitor just to see what it does and that's precisely what i did before i started chasing ph a, a little bit because you can do the co2 scrubber you can do the macroalgae re reactor you can do you know dose all kinds of ph elevating uh, additives like sodium hydroxide or strontium hydroxide and you won't really know what your baseline is until you know what your CO2 is, which is going to change with the seasons. You know, and a decent CO2 monitor these days is about a hundred bucks, give or take. Probably spend a little bit more to get a decent one on Amazon. But yeah, I have one that I, I use more or less, less for the tanks and more for the studio because when it's really cold in the wintertime, I'm trying to lock everything up. And when it's really hot in the summertime, I'm trying to keep the cool. Um, that the, the CO2 can get up to a thousand parts per million, you know, so 350 plus is kind of what it is outside. Um, and when there's, you know, two or three people working around the studio all day without breathing, it'll climb up to seven, 800 PPM up to a thousand PPM. And that indoor air quality is definitely affected when you're double atmospheric CO2. Um, so yeah, if you want to try to start chasing the pH or you want to, you know, brag about your pH 8.5, you know, regardless of what your corals are doing, start with a CO2 monitor um, because then you'll know a little bit more about the environment that your micro environment is sitting in. I uh, yeah. can't re recommend those enough. You should get one just for fun. You I might be have, surprised. I do, oh, you have, do have one. A CO2. Yeah, yeah. I, 
I just don't, I never wrote down what what I had before, and I want to say that maybe the PPMs went up about one to two hundred. Um, but now I'm definitely seeing us hitting nine hundred to a thousand certain days, um, yeah, especially I think that's in the like summer, because in the summer you don't get as much exterior air infiltration. I think as something mm-hmm. about like less wind, higher humidity. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's up there. Um, okay. but it, what's weird is, you know, like I've seen it go from 600 to a thousand, but I don't see like a corresponding change in my tank I think it takes a pH. while. For yeah, to, exactly. Know, right? The change in the, you're in the air can happen really quickly, yeah. but it takes a while for your aquarium to follow suit. Um, so you yeah, almost just, have to take like an average, right? Because you're, mm-hmm. you're hitting highs and lows. Um, so but yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I did try, uh, I did plumb my skimmer outside temporarily through a window and then tape the rest of the window shut as an experiment. But the pH only went up, uh, I want to say, and I know this is a lot on a pH scale, but it only went up like 0.1. I think and, that's a lot. Yeah, but... If you, you gain 0.1 on your pH without buying any consumable media or adding anything other than just directing your air outside, I think that's a big deal. That's, a, yeah. that's appreciable. I don't know. I mean, I, I know <laughs> the way the pH scale works. That is a lot, but I don't know if it's worth drilling a hole for that. Um, Just do yeah. it. Just do it. I strung up a whole line of tubing as a, what I call a snorkel for all the, the skimmers to tap into, and that helps refresh the air of the studio, right? It pulls in air from outside, and then some of it slowly leaks outside, and um, that's kind of my air exchange unit is the snorkel. I even put a loop on it right when it comes in. So when it gets really cold, it's going to condense on it. And that loop will literally just drip right next to the garage door where it doesn't matter. Nice. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at maybe next year uh, a ventilating dehumidifier, which I would need in the south because you've got 100% humid air outside and you don't want that coming in without some dehumidification. Because that way it's not just the tank, right? It's me sleeping better and all that fun stuff too. So. Anyway, I thought so, that was an interesting observation s- from my Speaking side. of getting outside your comfort, comfort zone, here's my totally forced segue. Um, going to Reefstock Australia, man, it was so freaking nice to pull off a show that we had to postpone for two years through the pandemic. And um, it was just such a blast to see a lot of faces and, you know, almost three years of anticipation build up for this particular conference because, you know, in the United States, we have dozens of reef shows, you know, a good top 10 or so. And in Australia, there's just one, you know, there's just one major reef aquarium conference and uh, you just really feel that energy there and it's just really cool to just see some of the different approaches and some of their different names you know one thing that stood out to me is like uh, you know what a convict chalice is i know i know yeah, uh, convict chalice it's got little stripes on it they were kind of really big a handful of years ago and they can't call it a convict chalice they have to call it uh, a prison break chalice right because it's just got these little stripes on it if you saw it you know you look you got a puzzled look on your face but if you saw it, you'd be like oh yeah okay i remember those guys and you know there's like frags of corals that have like a shimmy shimmery color in the u.s we'd call them oil spill and over there they call them petrol slick and there's just something about <laughs> australia they just i don't think it's intentional that they forced to do it you know differently um but it's just really fun to be immersed in that environment and just seeing people do their lights differently do their sums differently they keep different corals and even if you can sit there and like talk reef talk with them when you start looking at their tanks it's just going to be slightly different pumps slightly different lights slightly different settings slightly different uh, influence on how they put together their reef tanks no doubt aided by the fact that you know there's some calling some some companies that really focus on frags but there's a lot of colonies available uh in australia right because we're getting a bunch of colonies from them um in the uh, commercial side of, of the reef aquarium hobby and uh man it's just super cool to also talk to the collectors because most of the corals at Reefstock Australia are collected by somebody who's there. And sometimes it's just the collector themselves. And they can tell you exactly where they got that button, button scully versus that button scully. Or you would have really loved this. There was one guy that had a tank full of Wilson eyes. I mean, you think one, one coral collector, four foot tank, he's got more Wilson eyes than a whole big reef aquarium conference in the US. 
right? But they were specifically telling me, ah, oh, mate, mate, these are the tropical Wilson eyes right here. These are tropical. They won't bleach on you, mate. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, man, I wish Mark was here to just strike up that conversation and learn a little bit more about it. Because when I'm in the show, I can't absorb as much as I'd like. Um, that's why the first reef show I go to after reef stocks in Denver and Sydney are always my favorite because I can just be present. But yeah, you would have appreciated that angle. Yeah, one of those Australian collectors from, um, I guess that would be the west coast of Australia, um, has an Instagram account and he posts videos collecting. And it's it's fascinating, right? Like that's to me being that far away and seeing like how he's collecting these little little button corals, you know, that are this big, you know, these little scolimias and stuff. It's just, it's really cool. Um, yeah. I, again, I don't know what I, I would have to look it up. What it is, but it's uh, it's it's really it, it seems like over there the the collector to the hobbyist that that distance is much shorter than well they for all us, know each know? other or they know the guy who collected it you know so if you were you know really inquisitive about the corals that you were planning to buy or wanted to really learn more about the habitat you're not going to get this walt disney rainbow holy grail nonsense it's just like this is the coral this is where i got it this is what day i got it this is what i had for lunch right in between <laughs> the freaking breaks and this is what was growing next to it you know and it's just really being able to connect the corals with their wild and their natural environment um, it helps to transport me to the coral uh, in my reef tank. It's like a passport to where all these corals came from. You know, I think domestically we think about who we got these corals from, and that's more of a personal thing. But maybe more of a biological thing is like, where did this coral come from, and what journey did it take to get here? And um, it's for that reason, um, I'm hoping you will join me for a live session of reef therapy at Reefstock, Denver, and Australia. I would love to, man. I'm working on. I'm working on the pass. <laughs> uh, to go no but what you just said you know we talked about in the freshwater hobby where uh, people are obsessed about frontosas from different geographical areas of the lake right and they they name them as such um, and then you you bounce from a forum discussion on that to like a reef forum or you know I still do and then it's just you know bling bling glow stickville and how much did it cost? Yeah. There's so, 17 alien varieties of Holy Grail torch coral. I've got four or five myself. I'm like, which one's the real one? I don't know. They're, they're nice. They're all yellows. They got some greens to them, but that doesn't add dimension to the coral. You know, if, if monetary value is your only dimension, then I pity, <laughs> I pity you for that. Um, but yeah, I think there's just like a much better story um, yes. that you can attach to the fish and the corals. And we get a lot of that at Reefstock Australia. You've got to be there. I'm not going to let, let you not come. <laughs> Dude, I would love to go to Australia. I've never been. So, um, so my plan after Reefstock Australia, uh, first, I mean, I do want to thank everybody in the reef scene over there for coming out. I met so many people and uh, we had some great prizes, great talks, great conversation. We had a giant dinner with like 120 people. We just took over a restaurant on Saturday night. Um, definitely want to thank David Mai for um, kind of being the MC of the show and organizing that dinner. Um, it was just cool, you know, like in the reef aquarium hobby in the US, it's everything's kind of fragmented and you got all these different clicks of who keeps what kind of corals and who sells what kind of gear. But over there, it's still one big happy family, like if as if Macna was still only like 400, 500 people where we can all hang out at the same bar. Now it's gotten, you know, too big and fragmented and um, it's nice to just see Australia still be like one big family. But I was That's planning cool. to go diving after that um, on the southern Great Barrier Reef, but we got totally skunked on the weather, man. Um, apparently, it's La Nina year, and uh, it's been raining everywhere and lots of wind. Um, so that's unfortunate, but honestly like my history of like dive trips has been, been very little like rain outs. So it's like, I think it was kind of due kind of do for it but i did um spend some time with ultra corals australia and got to spend a lot of like quality time with freshly harvested corals like people don't even understand how much of the reef needs to be like cut off of the base of those corals before they can go anywhere you know like you talked about that one instagrammer who's collected mini scolies and wilson eyes like it comes with a little piece of rock 
and yeah. you have to remove that There's before a little chiseling you ship action it to somebody. Going on, yeah. yeah, if you were taking that straight to your tank, no problem. But if you put it in a bag, um, there's a lot of variables there that can foul the water or just cause too much stress on the corals. And so when these corals are fresh harvested, man, they, they have to spend a lot of work chiseling off everything from, from underneath it. But uh, Oh, there, I saw a lot of great corals at Ultra Corals Australia. Did you see today's story about the kind of morpha? Not yet. No. I yeah, there's there's a been couple straight from work. So no, so that's, that's okay, man. But there's a couple like chalice corals, like Echinomorpha and Perichinophilia. They're just totally different, but like adjacent to typical classic Echinophilias. And it was nice to finally see some Echinomorphas that look like the pictures and corals of the world, right? Very similar to a Vicensis when you see it in pictures. And then when you see it in person, you're like, oh, wait, no, that's just a, a chalice coral with just one mouth, <laughs> with just a single mouth. And just like a weird kaleidoscope of colors and pastel pinks and blues and greens with like a little yellow accent to every spine. But they just look like little miniature volcanoes with this like one big coralite on top. And when they get bigger, they can pop off like a couple polyps here and there. But it's just one of those oddball, super cool corals that are just not part of the you know popular dozen species that you know rules the reef aquarium hobby these days for the simple fact that even if you got a colony you'd be probably hard pressed to propagate it because it only has one mouth right you know but that's part of the diversity of colors and appearances that we're just totally missing because you know um the u.s reef scene is definitely uh, motivated by speculation <laughs> right, buy that coral, grow it out, sell it off, make your money back. And that's uh, that rules the reef aquarium uh, conversation a little bit too much in the U.S. So it was really cool to be at the collector and just see like hundreds of fresh scolies alongside hundreds of like old scolies that they're tank hardening. Um, and chalices. Oh man, I'm doing a whole series on chalices, uh, pectinias, different varieties of convict chalices, alien eye chalices, orange chalices. Um, so that was pretty fun. Nice. Yeah. That's, and then you went over to New Caledonia and did some diving there. But before that, um, I got to see platypuses in the wild. What? Yeah, I saw platypuses in the wild. Um, Nick and Ivy Dos Santos took us to a place called Yungala, uh, Hala, if there's anybody in that area, but it's like a slightly hilly area. And um, we went to this, to this creek river thing that has, you know, certain like bodies of water that were kind of still and boom, there they were, you know, they're just a real creature out in the wild, just, you know, floating at the surface and then they dive down and go do their work and then they come back up and, and just repeat the process. So I think we saw like five or six different um, individuals two in the, to about two in each pool. And uh, that was pretty crazy. So I've read that they have, is this true? They've got um, a venomous claw in their i think in their hind legs i think it's just the males okay. have one venomous claw in their hind legs but it's like uh it's like a sea snake or uh, a blue ring octopus kind of situation you really have to try to get stung I, I mean i don't know for sure but it's one of those things like you can handle one just fine you're not going to accidentally get stung like you were touching a fire coral or something you know but they're facing backwards and probably you know venom is it is, is expensive resource yeah um to to manufacture as an as an organism and so they're probably only using those when they're like you know running away from something um but in addition to the platypus this was probably crazy crazier um we went uh they call it low white low tide walking what we would call tide pooling um but we went to this reef that experiences uh 30 meter sorry sorry 30 foot tides so about 10 meter fluctuation from the surface to the bottom right and um we were seeing like neap tides a lot of places that we went to and it was kind of crazy to walk on an exposed coral reef that is normally under 30 feet of water that is crazy that's a huge tide I mean, it's not, relatively it's speaking. not all the time. This was actually just ex exaggerated for this time of year. Okay. Um, but man, I stepped on so many toadstool corals. <laughs> I stepped Squish. on so many toadstool leathers and turban areas. And it's just crazy to walk in that habitat. And it's just like lots of turban areas, lots of leather corals. 
and it's, it's, it's influenced by the tides, right? So a little bit further down, we would see certain acros here and there, and they're high latitude acroporas and some stylos, but mixed in between all that stuff, there'd be some lords, there'd be some acan pachyceptas, you know, there'd be a little bit of lobophilias, um, but I have never stepped on the coral in my life, and then on that walk, <laughs> just- Unavoidable. <laughs> unavoidable, like even, you know, first half hour really, walking carefully not to step on the corals but they were they're literally like grass they're just covering all the rocks everywhere and one thing that you know one the thing that kind of strikes me about leather corals in the wild they don't get that big the, you, the, all the biggest leather corals i see are in our aquariums that's where the sarcophytans well, okay get the, you're talking sarcophytans yeah, yeah mostly sarcophytes okay. the toadstools they get the size of a freaking table in our aquariums and in the wild you don't really see that you know, I think uh, between predation and just natural factors, um, they'll break apart into a few pieces, you know. So I think the largest specimen we might have seen was probably about 10 inches across. So like 25 centimeters or something. And um, but, yeah, in this particular environment, they were like grass and they were freaking everywhere. And every, and, and every now and then you'd see one that was really nice and green, um, very showy. But, um, man, so many, so many turban areas. And it's really, really astounding. That coral does not get nearly enough love. Yeah, when you said leather coral, I, I thought about, you know, in Africa seeing the huge lobophytums, you know, I guess devil's hand, but I consider that a, a leather coral as well. Mm -hmm. Those things get massive. But yeah, to your point about sarcophyton, um, I guess, I mean, I've, I've, I haven't seen a lot like you have, but yeah, I've, they do tend to be bigger in an aquarium. Yeah. Um, it's that gentler environment, no predation, and we're always wafting all the crap that would build up inside. I think naturally in the ocean, if it got to about 18 inches, two feet long, there's just going to be a natural spot in the middle where like Seven. crud will build up and then it will rot out. And then the coral will just kind of naturally break up into multiple colonies. And that's one of the ways that it spreads. Yeah, that's true. I, that's one of the weediest corals in, in my experience is the uh, green polyp sark because it I've seen people grow it really large, but in my tanks, it always just fissures itself. It always just yep. drops lobes off, and next thing you know, you got pieces everywhere in your pieces tank. Pieces everywhere. And, which is fine, but, you know, because they're, they're not hard to clean up. Uh, no, no, they're not. They're not hard to clean up. They're not hard to give away or to throw on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> if everybody's already got it. But, yeah, after that, um, I went to New Caledonia, which is a French uh, territory between Australia and Fiji. And that's where the conspicuous angels come from. And um, I'll just cut to the chase. I did not get to see one out in the wild, but I was able to connect with a local fish collector there and the public aquarium there and some dive outfits. And um, man, it was just a really different kind of time, you know, because it's not like these raggedy, like Pacific Island roads that just barely qualified as a road. They were like go-kart tracks. And I rented a uh, Toyota Yaris hybrid with a built-in uh, uh, CarPlay or the car play that I can link from my phone. And it was just yeah. made getting around so much easier. And it was just, it's weird to be in a really developed little island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And because their economy is based mostly off the nickel mines, um, somehow that has a, translated to a lot less impact on the reefs, right? Because it's they, they treat it like Europe, right? They have to follow the European guidelines for environmental protections. So I'm sure there's some runoff and some spills and some toxic leaching somewhere. But wherever where I was, man, um, the, the lagoon just right around Noumea, the capital city, was just freaking pristine. You know, I didn't see dying corals. I saw lots of new recruits. Um, yeah, it was really, really different kind of uh, dive experience for sure. How long of a flight is that from Australia? Like three hours. That's not bad three hours and the airline air Carolina like serves you some really good food like two meals in that three hours <laughs> um but um i think the first place we, we do is this place called ilo canal which is just translates to duck island and it's this very small islet basically uh maybe half a mile a mile away from like the main beach and um uh there's tourists there snorkeling all over the place and breaking the corals and it looks like it helps right you picture tourists 
stepping on corals and breaking over branches. But when I saw this particular reef, everything was just regrowing. And there was just fields of all these different corals. And it was really turbid water. But that's where I saw the tubular um, Econopora. Like, I, you know, they were, I, I don't even know where to start as far as seeing stony corals growing tubular branches. I've seen the pictures of Econopora ashmorensis developing these tubes. But at this one particular place, it was just fields of tubes. And I called it uh, Super Mario Pora in one of my <laughs> social posts because it just looks like a whole bunch of tubes. I'm like, man, I want that in an aquarium. And it wasn't even just one color, right? It's just all, it was for some reason there was a lot of Econoporas in, Econo in New Caledonia. Um, so I saw Ashmorensis, I saw Lamellosa, I saw um, Harita, which is the, the species that I have. But over there, it wasn't just a bunch of species, but a bunch of different colors. So the tubular Econoporas, there was a brown, there was a gray, there was another one with like a green polyps and um just super cool and one thing that really took me back about this particular snorkel dive snorkel and short shallow dive that we did at uh, ilocana is there were so many fish so many freaking fish and i just can't help but correlate the health of the corals to the abundance of fish right because they're not like a, uh, a subsistence you know lifestyle like other Pacific islands that they just have to harvest whatever they can from the ocean, you know? So there's plenty of clams, plenty of fish. You know, I saw, a, what was it? Probably like a four or five foot coral trout hanging out in about eight foot of water, just looking up at me. And I've seen plenty of coral trouts before, but never just hanging out in that shallow of water with just tourists all over snorkeling all over the place. And just, I've also never seen so many parrotfish. Right, parrotfish are such an important keystone species for the reef, and we don't talk about them at all, right? We just care about keeping our reef tanks happy and pretty, but in a lot of other places, that is like a delicacy. It's one of those fish that gets speared and harvested and fished out first, you know? So to see like a giant school of, of parrotfish with two or three different species mixed in with some rabbit fish and then like male, female, juvenile colorations and that, that, that sound that they make underwater, oh, yeah. man. That was pretty freaking awesome. Pretty awesome. I saw so many fish. I actually played a little bit of fish bingo. You know, obviously I've wanted to see the conspicuous angelfish from, you know, New Caledonia, but they're, they're rare um, in most habitats. So I guess there are certain places where they, you know, they can find them. I don't know if that's the population center there, but I saw stark-eyed damselfish in the wild, uh, the Australian form, or I would say the coral sea form that's between New Caledonia and Australia. And it's funny to see those in the wild, like be diving with them just a couple feet away, the same way I look at the ones that I have. Um, I saw some Pictilothanthias a little bit deeper. Um, and then Watanabe angelfish. That was the dominant swallowtail angelfish species in New Caledonia. I think I saw one zebra Milanospilo. So I was like, hey, what are you doing there? <laughs> but in a lot of places of the world, uh, for some reason, Watanabe's are actually much, much deeper. And that's common for the Genicanthus to be found deeper and in cooler waters and higher flow. But it was, you know, wintertime, so the water was a little bit on the colder side. Interesting. Yeah, it's always fun to see, <clears throat> one, to see aquarium fish, but then to see something that's sort of, uh, I guess, maybe rare in the trade. But even... Um, I don't know sometimes you go to a destination and you quickly on day one realize like all the fish that are common like all right I've seen 30 of these but then when you see that one aquarium fish that sort of pops out of a cave that you don't see the whole trip um, I had that with a, a, a blue throat trigger you know I wouldn't call those rare fish but I just only saw one in my whole trip to Hawaii and it was just kind of like hey what are you doing here you know versus there he is versus all of the humus and all the other Hawaiian triggers that you know you, everyone sees, every tourist sees. And yeah, every time you turn your, your head, you'll just see another one. But along those same lines, I did see some femininist wrasse in the wild. Really? Yes, Rory. <laughs> yes, really. Um, it's so weird because there's a lot of fish there, and a lot of them are just kind of hanging around their little bombies and just doing their fishy things. But for some reason, the feminists, they were going somewhere. Right? So when I finally spotted my they first were like pair. They were commuting across the reef somewhere? I saw a male and a female. And they, they for some reason, my aquarium, aquaristic mind is just like, oh, somebody just let those go. Right? Because they're going somewhere. And they're going away from me is where they're going. So I only saw one male, one pair, male and female. And they were 
going somewhere and on another dive i saw a separate female but that was that was a rare fish um in new caledonia and i only saw a couple examples but it's just man it's super cool to, to see them just see a fish that is revered um in the aquarium hobby just just being a natural animal <laughs> just, well, just living you, out there when you see something that makes you have to pull out your fish book like is this in its natural range like should i be seeing this fish here you know uh, that with that blue throw trigger that's what i had to do i had to google it real quick when i got back on land i was like wait a minute are those do do they have those in Hawaii? You know, because <laughs> I wasn't sure off the top of my head. So it's always fun when you you're like, yeah, that no, I knew that fish would be here. Yeah, and it went like, but you'll you'll go somewhere and then you'll have that question like, wait, I didn't I didn't know they had those. You know, yeah. Um, I had that with like rose bubble tips. You know, this was many many moons ago when um, before all the crazy Colorado sunbursts and all that. But yeah, it's the same thing. Africa, I was like, wait, they got RBTAs here? Like, okay, yeah. Like I saw a bunch of brown ones everywhere, right? But then you see like a glowing red one, you're like, oh wait. Oh snap. Yeah, I didn't know but, those um, were here. Some of the other reef dives I did, you know, it's it, there is defer- definitely like a divide between like the acros that really thrive on flow and the acros that prefer to a little bit more sheltered environment because around Noumea is a really huge lagoon and there's a lot of reef sites inside the lagoon. But the dive outfit that we went with, you know, they were taking some more casual scuba divers that want to see sharks and mantas. And so we went to the outer reef quite a bit. And those are just, it's like you find the same corals in both places, but totally different abundance of each one, you know. So inside the lagoon, there's a lot more of the bottle brush and some of the uh, more delicate species and, you know, the occasional humulus and millipora. Millipora is usually inside. And outside the lagoon, there's a lot more robust acroporas and microclados. And uh, I did see one colony of some acro, probably microclado style. It was um, three quarters brown and then one quarter like bluish green with colored tips, like a total natural chimera. And uh, I did a I did a boo boo on that dive. I had my camera with me, and I was cleaning up the camera that night, and I put the lens cap on. So it wasn't until I was like ten feet under that I pulled the cover off the dome port and saw that I had the lens cap on the camera. Oh no! <laughs> but to be honest, it made for a better dive because instead of looking through my camera, I was really just holding my camera and just really looking around. And that's one of the dives that we saw a feminist dress on. And, uh, you know, I really encourage any reefer, if you have the opportunity to just do even a little bit of diving, um, it'll help uh, correlate what we do in our aquariums with where these corals come from in the wild. And when you learn some of that stuff for yourself or at least observe where corals are and where they aren't and you apply it to your tank man it just it's just a separate different strain of research that you can do f- for your aquarium yeah i agree uh i i could only dream about diving to some of the places you've been like the solomon islands and um Obviously, now you've hit New Caledonia. You've, um, I want to say you've been, well, you did the liverboard in Indonesia, but didn't you also, you've been to the Marshall Islands, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, you don't have to go far. I wouldn't say the Caribbean is the best place because we don't have those corals in our aquariums. Right. But any place that's nice and, you know, coral abundant um, in the broader Indo Pacific, you're going to make some of the kind of observations that will matter for your tank, for sure. Yeah, I need to get back out there to that side of the world. So our dive gear, you know, uh, took a three-year break, I think. Maybe not quite that long because I did go to Cozumel for a little stint. But this was like the, the dive trip, to, the trip to go diving on. And, um, you know, we've cleaned up all the dive gear, rinsed it off, and I'm about to put it back in and put it on the shelf. I'm like, oh, man, I hope I can dust this off in a few months. I don't want to go stay, stay dry for that long. But, you know, one thing that was really surprising is – when I first walked into the studio after, you know, traveling for almost 24 hours, like all the tanks, they just appeared so different to me. The dimensions of where things were had really skewed while I was gone. And then it took me a while to recalibrate where all the corals were and where the, the tanks were. Um, it's kind of hard to describe. It was like walking in and having a little bit of vertigo. So do you mean by size or location of things or what? just the dimensions of where everything is 
hmm. have, you know, being gone for three weeks after, you know, being here almost every day for, for three years. I'm just like, I had to step back a little bit and be like, man, these, these, these reef tanks really are meant to be viewed from, from a distance. But the best part was coming in. And, you know, a lot of times when I travel, I always think that there's some sacrifices to be made. Like some fish will bully another fish and I'm not going to catch it um, while I'm gone, obviously, or a coral will fall into another coral. and by the time I get to it, it's, it's too far gone. And I always think there's like a little bit of sacrifice. And while I'm, while I'm away, I'm like, I just assume that this par for the course, but I came back and I didn't have that offering to the coral gods this time. So I'm really, really thankful for that. Yeah. I can't recall the last time I've taken more than a week off. So you were talking about being three weeks away. I, I know you weren't on vacation. I mean, restock was fun, but it was probably, you know, it was busy work, right? It was, uh, yeah. it was busy days ahead, but, um, but it's funny. I, I, uh, I'm with you that I assume some things, I, you know, I might come back and some coral is, you know, it just took a dump. Uh, but you know, three others have grown twice as big than I that more than I anticipated, or something crazy will happen when I go away for a while. Um, the funniest thing that happened to me recently was I was up in New York for work. I'm in I'm in Manhattan. I'm in an office in a conference room, talking to people, and I look down and I see that my daughter called. I'm like, all right, you know, send that to voicemail. I'm in the middle of a meeting. Then my seven year old son, who doesn't have a phone got on his iPad and FaceTime me and starts ringing my phone, right? So I'm like, all right, if my seven-year-old is calling right after my daughter call, like something's horribly wrong. Like, you know, maybe there's something wrong with my wife, you know, like, hey, ma, something's wrong with mom. So in the middle of this meeting, I'm like, I'm so sorry, I have to take this. And my son, uh, Luke, is like, one of your fish jumped out of the tank, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that was the big drama. What was great is that they rescued the fish, right? Like they got it back in the tank and, you know, it coughed up some dust and it, you know. <laughs> um, so it was a swallowtail, you know, Genicanthus. So, um, again, how he jumped over four inches of glass, I mean, I guess the, my, my hope of that wall of glass being enough to keep all my fish in is, is lost. Um, I did know that it wasn't like 100% foolproof, right? But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, and then everybody in the meeting has to know what's wrong, right? Like, is everything okay? And then you have to explain what happened to a bunch of uh, financial people who have, like, don't know anything about aquariums. And, yeah, so. <laughs> but, well, that is a better story than, you know, my, my wife and my family has been kidnapped. Well, <laughs> that they want or, a ransom. Yeah, or even le much less worse is coming home to, you know, uh, well, I don't think the fish was... I have a dog. It would have become a, a seafood potato chip for that dog Oops. pretty quick. Yeah, so... But anyway, you know, I, I would have been... It's sad to say I would have been, like, okay with that losing that fish because I just think it comes with the territory sometimes when you go out of town, right? Yeah. Uh, I would have been sad about it, though, but... Yeah, but I know. I think this, con this, this session of reef therapy just highlights some of the things to expect while you're away. And I think, you know, you talking about what you did to your reef tank to put it on track the way you know how not trying new fancy weirder things but just going back to the fundamentals just really underscores the need for most reefers to master that before they go and put on some you know crazy bells and whistles and recirculating co2 scrubbers and and idolizing a ph of 8.5 as if that is going to magically make your tank look that much better because it won't you know, your aquas will grow faster, your SPS will grow faster. Um, but at the end of the day, that means your aquascape is going to shift more quickly. You know, and no one's talking about growing a reef tank to a certain point and then figuring out how to slow the growth down. So you don't have to maintain the bejesus out of it and, and frag it as much as, as it requires. You know, so maybe, uh, you know, no one thought we'd be dosing nitrates and phosphates, but I think in the next few years, we might be talking about how to slow down coral growth while keeping the corals looking as good as possible. So you don't have to do that much more maintenance. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing you've actually done some videos on that I don't see a lot of people discussing, but um, what happens after two to five years when your tank's all grown in mature, how do you, <clears throat> one, you know, forget all the, I mean, there's plenty of people talking about old tank syndrome and this and that, but how do you garden it from that point on, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I really enjoyed your video where you took a stag that just grew in a funky way, and I always would get frustrated by that and you 
you literally took a midsection out and just glued it back together. And I thought, that's what sometimes, I, th- I think for somebody who has a tank that's all overgrown, um, there's the, I'm just going to hack it all back and start over. But um, I definitely think there's probably a really strong technique involved and skill to just pruning it in a manageable way that it never has to you, you don't have like an ugly phase where you have to let everything regrow you have to wait three to six months for the axle tips to come back i can see that yellow tip austera coral right now from here that was glowing glued back onto its base it looks amazing you know yeah. uh i trimmed a branch off uh, shortly before i left that was starting to encroach on my blue hoax of my acro and you can't even tell you know, the coral just looks nice and full, and it doesn't have this six-inch section of just kind of nothing going on. You know, the, all the growth is coming from the bottom, and uh, uh, it's, uh, they still have like six to nine months before I have to repeat that procedure, I think. Looking at it now, I'm like, oh, I could do it again, but I could also leave it alone. <laughs> but it's that, how do you keep a mature tank mature and pretty, right? Yeah, looking mature. Yeah, yeah. that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, those are some of this, um, the sacrifices I made before I left is, you know, for example, I have the crystal experiment green Montipora um, in my main Montipora aquarium. And there was a big colony in there. And when we did a water change and I started like plucking out a couple branches, it had a little bit of that smell because it's like in the middle and it's like really overgrown. And then all the branches shelter the inside. So it causes more growth and more stagnation there. And uh, I just pulled the whole thing out pulled the whole thing out, plucked off a couple branches because I have other colonies growing and I just threw that whole piece away. It wasn't even worth salvaging every yeah. single last bit of skin. And so I'm leaving that space open for the corals there to just kind of rebound and I'm going to put another kind of new frag, mini colony of it inside um, and it'll be you know look better than ever in no time. You know? Nice. Yeah. But uh, man, it's really cool to catch up with you. I know it's been a minute. Um, I think next week I'd really like to talk about the epidemic of products that won't break your reef tank. Because when you look at a list of different products that won't break your reef tank and you look at a reef shop and think all the things that might help, but mostly they won't hurt, you realize there's just so many comp- companies that are just building their brands off the stuff that may or may not really be helping your tank. You got any foreshadowing for that in, in your on your part? No, I mean, that's, I wasn't thinking about um, the inventory of a local fish store when I did it, but uh, that's the exact frame of mind that I went through with my problem child tank, right, was just... Um, all the things that we do bacterial dosing or you know fancy gadgets and it's like or you know just how much of some of these things how much of a difference do they make they're fun to tinker with if you're a hobbyist but um are they really going to put you level you up from somebody that's just doing water changes and just being on top of keeping their skimmer running in top condition and you know, for my point of view, maybe grow a little algae in a sump. Just just standard good good maintenance and care. And depending on how big your tank is, you know, if you have a reasonable, normal household reef tank, salt's pretty cheap. Um, you, know, you just think about all the crap you can order versus just, like, screw it. I'm just going to up on my maintenance game a little bit and then patiently wait and see if things start to turn into a different direction, you know? So so that that's exactly it, man. It's like instead of uh, figuring out what I could buy online or at a local fish store to solve my problem, it was just like, well, why don't we just go back to basics here? Back to the basics. So if you guys have any questions or comments about things you'd like to see us discuss in the next session of reef therapy, you know, regarding things that are questionably useful for your reef tank, or I, I just always call it like this epidemic of things that won't break your tank, right? You, you can sell somebody this thing and they're never going to call you and say that they have a problem, right? You're just basically cashing it in. If you got any feedback or questions or thoughts on it, put those down in the comments below. We'll definitely use those as a guide uh, for next week's session. Mark, it's great to see you again, man. I'm glad you got your reef tank back on track. Yeah, and, welcome uh, back. I'm glad your reef- tanks are all surviving or survived that three-week out of, you know, absence. <laughs> 
That's good. That's how it should be. Yeah. That's how it should really be. It shouldn't be that, you know, you look at your reef tank six months and there's no problem and then you leave for a week and then a problem ensh uh, ensues, right? That's how it should be. So let's uh, focus on that next week and uh, glad to be back in the seat. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Later, Mark. See you.